Hello and welcome to the second webinar of Aquafit Horizons Online. My name is Lucia Barreiro and I am the editor of Aquafit.com. Aquafit Horizons has taken place in Europe and Bangkok since 2006 and we hope to return to the live format as soon as we can. Meanwhile, we are grateful to be able to deliver the same quality content as the live editions with two webinars on processing technology, ingredients and formulation for the production of aquatic feeds. Thanks to the support of our sponsors, Diamond V, Laleman, and Nusid, registration is free. Today, in the second webinar, Advances in Ingredients and Formulation, we have four presentations that will cover new oil and protein sources, as well as functional feeds. The webinar will run for an hour and a half. Each speaker will give a 15-minute presentation, and then we will get to a final panel session to answer questions from the audience. To submit a question, please type it in the Q&A box. Any unanswered questions will be answered by email. And we will send a link to the recorded webinar in the coming days. All webinars will be available on our website or on YouTube. I want to especially thank our assistant editor and webinar manager, Marisa Yanaga, who is making sure that all our webinars work. And some of you might expect to have Albert taken as the moderator, but he is sick and we hope he will recover soon. Our moderator today will be Pete Hutchinson. Pete is our technical editor, an aquaculture nutritionist, extrusion and processing expert, and an independent aquafic consultant. And he is based in New Zealand. Pete, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Lucia, for the introduction. And uh, hello to everyone out there. Um, and thank you for joining. Um, I'd uh, like to uh, kick off with uh, Pablo Berner. Um, he is um, going to be uh, discussing a novel source of omega-3 to advance fish nutrition and sustainability. Um, this is from Nusi. This is a, uh, actually a topic which is very interesting to me. Um, and I've been following along, so it'll be interesting to, um, to hear this um, presentation. Pablo has over 20 years of experience in a range of roles within the aquaculture industry. His experience includes leading a fish pharmaceutical company, launching a salmon production startup, and working as an operations manager for a crustacean fishing company. His extensive knowledge in salmon farming in Chile and Norway paved the way for his current role as a key relationship manager with salmon farming companies and fish feed producers in Chile. In this role, he educates farmers and production companies about Aquaterra, new seed and the relevance of new renewable resources of omega-3. So uh, Pablo, if I could uh, hand over to you and uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Pete. Thank you everyone to attend this webinar. I will share my screen. Okay, so thanks to Aquafit Horizons for inviting us to share Aquaterra, superior omega-3. Aquaterra is a call to the aquaculture industry to nurture the land and sea. NUSEED is an international organization. It has grown rapidly since its start in Australia in 2006. Our four global regions include Australia, Europe, North and South America. There are over 250 employees working across 11 global locations, including two world-class innovation centers, one in Victoria, Australia, and the other in California. We are global leaders in agronomics and plant breeding, de developing new agricultural solutions for environmental challenges, like our novel plant-based source of omega-3. NUSEED developed omega-3 canola to increase the supply of DHA for aquaculture. Aquaculture depends on omega-3 in feed for fish health and provides these nutrients to human health in the fillet. The ocean cannot supply enough to support industry growth. Aquaterra is designed as a feed ingredient, enhancing the oil mix in aqua feeds. 
We create Aquaterra to support the growth of aquaculture, feed people efficiently, create industry, and improve fish welfare. To full fight shortage of omega-3, relieve pressure on the ocean, and show what is possible with plant technology. We also create Aquaterra to modernize and innovate the oil mix for aquafits. I would like you to invite to watch the short video which was prepared for this occasion. Until now, fish oil has been the primary source of omega-3 nutrients for the aquaculture and dietary supplement industries. The problem is that the ocean cannot sustainably provide enough omega-3 to meet minimum nutritional needs for an ever-growing global population. Collecting omega-3 from only wild fish pressures ocean ecosystems that provide income and food for people and habitats for marine animals. Consider also that fish ultimately derives omega-3s from microalgae. So why not just go direct to the source? Well, there are some factories growing microalgae for omega-3, helping to take pressure off the ocean. However, it takes lots of water and energy to produce these algal oils, making it an expensive and resource-intensive solution. New Seed takes a new approach by applying biotechnology to deliver the benefits of microalgae through canola, creating a DHA and ALA-rich source of land-based omega-3s. Just one hectare of New Seed's omega-3 canola produces an equivalent amount of DHA and EPA. And bonus, it grows on existing farmland, helping to replenish soil and provides habitats for over 2,000 beneficial insects, including honeybees. Plus, our grower contracts create new economic opportunities for farmers by managing the closed-loop supply chain and guaranteeing purchase. This stabilizes supply and costs for the aquaculture and nutrition industries. New Seeds Aquaterra and Nutraterra ensure reliable, renewable omega-3 production. Okay, so thanks for watching that short video. I am trying to advance the slide, exactly. So how did we make this innovation? Aquaterra is a product of sophisticated technology. We insert seven microalgae genes into canola, giving a land-based crop the genetics to create its own long chain fatty acids. Our goal was to go straight away, go all the way to DHA. Aquaterra offers a unique omega-3 profile that improves omega-6, omega-3 ratio. Our novel omega-3 brings a new era for feed ingredients with, with an elegant technology. The aquaculture industry recognized the need for new sources of omega-3 and came together to collaborate to validate Aquaterra. Our partners share NUSIS dedication to innovation and proactive sustainability policies and supported every step of development. First, the genetic development to create our technology with recognized institutions from Australia like CSIRO and GRDC. Second, food safety and viability for application on aquafits. Also, a work together with recognized scientific institutions in Norway. And third, commercial scale trials with leaders in salmon farming, like Salmones Multi Export and Aqua Chile, and also together with the main feed processing plants uh, based in Chile, creating Biomar Salmon Food. During 2018 and 2019, we performed three commercial scale trials. 
We hope to show Aquaterra is an effective omega-3 oil, but the results exceeded our own expectations. Aquaterra was part of an oil mix, complementing and replacing part of the fish oil from commercial diets. You can see in this column, trial one, trial two, trial three. We replace fish oil between 30 and 60%. In trial one and two, salmon were fed from one kilo up to six kilo harvest size. And for trial three, uh, the fish was fed by Aquaterra diet and control diet from a small to harvest size, which means full sea cycle. The diet always remain, even the control diet and the Aquaterra diet remains only with the same EPA DHA content which shows the flexibility to formulate with our product. Re the results evaluated production parameters. The main important is growth, a specific feeding rate, and also feed conversion ratio. Fish fed Aquaterra grew as expected with improvements in feed conversion ratio. You can see standard diet and in the dark blue uh, Aguaterra in all the different trials. Among the most surprising results was the improved productivity. Seen in all the three trials consistently. We attribute this to Aguaterra's unique omega-3 profile, increasing total omega-3 in the fish, which improves health and welfare. The average survivability uh, increased by up, approximately 2% in all the trials. This improvement is especially notable when fish are challenged. This chart shows fish mortality. Aguaterra is on the bottom. This is a full period of production, all cages fed by Aguaterra diet and cages fed by control diet. The red spikes indicates an outbreak because of, of a challenge, sanitary challenge. And you can see the Aguaterra fed fish were more resilient. Aquaculture is under pressure to reduce reliance on wild fish for feed. This is both to meet consumer demand for more sustainable food and the industry need for sustainable growth. Aquaterra's partial repayments to fish oil reduce fish forage dependency ratio by up to 61% and fish in fish out ratio by up to 27%, always depending on the inclusion rates. Aquaterra's unique fatty acid profile provides DHA, EPA, and alpha linolenic acid, ELA, for a total omega 3 content over 30%. Aquaterra increases the total omega-3 on salmon fillet, as you can see in the chart. By improving nutrition and adding value, aquaculture can become center of the plate worldwide. So now we'll, we go to a practice exercise. Um, using Aquaterra in the oil mix allows to create the perfect complement to fish oil and a standard canola, very well used in salmon feed or aqua feeds. Let's take a look at how the feed is improved with just 6% inclusion rate. Aquaterra diet remains isoenergetic, isoprotein, and achieve the same EPA DHA content as a standard diet, reducing fish oil dependency. In this example, the standard diet is, for example, 1.74 EPA DHA, same as Aguaterra. But you can see the omega-6, omega-3 ratio is far below one for the Aguaterra diet. And also, if we see the DHA EPA ratio is far over one, which means a great source of DHA providing this great source 
to organs, tissues, and membranes. It's well recognized scientifically that DHA in excess is metabolized by the fish and retroconverts to EPA, which means that then improved total omega-3 for fish health. You can see in this diet is more than 40% total omega-3 on the oil mix and at the end in the feed. Over the last years, we have been building partnership within the industry. BAP and ASC are the most common and recognized certifications for responsible aquaculture. Aquaterra is aligned with those certifications and we are members of Global Aquaculture Alliance since 2020. After a period of six months evaluation, Nucid's Aquaterra had been recognized by Friends of the Sea for its responsible production and contribution to maintain oceans equilibrium. Last year, we had been nominated by the Global Aquaculture Alliance as an innovation of the year. We greatly appreciate the recognition and customer support on that initiative. Aquaterra facilitates aquaculture growth and is able to double the world's supply of DHA. We have a certified traceable supply chain, which allows to reduce fish, fish forage dependency ratio. One hectare of omega-3 canola is equal to 10,000 kilograms of wild fish. It's easily scalable to grow with aquaculture industry and reduces greenhouse gas footprint. Aquaterra delivers the benefit of omega-3 from seed to feed. To full, to full, the full supply chain is certified traceable by excellence through stewardship. The new seed logistics team built a reliable supply chain from the US to the aquaculture production markets with the majority of volume heading to Chile. Aquaterra omega-3 canola oil is a reliable novel source of omega-3. It's recognized by the industry and scientific leaders like Nofima to play a major role on aquaculture sustainable growth. Thank you very much for today. Thank you for attending the conference. And I hope I express properly in English this uh, presentation and this contact with Lucy and Aguaterra. Thank you again. Thank you, Pablo. That was um, that was great. Very, very interesting um, topic. And uh, look forward to uh, questions at the uh, at the end of the session on um, on new seed. Um, next up, uh, next in line, um, we have uh, Derek uh, Petrie. He um, is going to be speaking about the impact of postbiotic fermentation ingredients on shrimp. So uh, Derek is is uh, Diamond V's director of research and technical services. He has extensive experience in the animal health industry and holds a PhD in genetics and statistics, a master's in genetics and a master's in business administration from the University of Nebraska. He also has a master's in food science from Kansas State University and completed his undergraduate work in poultry science at Texas A&M University. His career has included nearly 20 years in the swine industry and he has held a number of senior level positions prior to joining Diamond V including VP of Research and Food Safety Quality, CEO and Global Director of Research and Chief Development Officer. Uh, so Derek, I'll, I'll hand over to you uh, and looking forward to um, hearing more about um, this uh, ingredient. Well, thank you for the introduction. Let me uh, share my screen here. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about this, uh, this interesting topic of the postbiotic fermentation. Um, thank you guys for Aquafeed for setting this up. So goal today is to kind of introduce you to the, the one of the term, the newer terms that we're using postbiotics, but also to kind of introduce you a little bit to Diamond B. 
So a little bit about Diamond V. We were founded in 1943. So we've been in business for well over 75 years. Our, our headquarters is in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And we have a global distribution in more than 70 countries and more than 300 employees located in 22 different countries. And so when we think about our product and how it works and what all we do, uh, we, we were very uh, adamant about having our product be at the same location where we, where we make it here in Cedar Rapids to make sure we don't have any um, discrepancies of how this product is produced. Um, it's a science-based technology. We have over 500 control research studies that we've done and over 140 peer review publications. Now this does include multiple species of animals. Derek, uh, I need to interrupt you for a second. We're unable to see your screen, your shared screen. Okay. Oh. There we go. Very sorry there, I did not hit the share button. There we go, thank you. I started the share, but it did not start, it did not go through, my apologies. Okay, so uh, I was basically to, to about here. Um, so yes, uh, go back to, uh, we're a science-based technology company. We've done over 500 control research studies, have over 140 peer review publications. We've done this in numerous species, uh, including humans, including aqua, uh, you know, poultry, swine, uh, ruminants. And so we also have this uh, unique technology that we've developed, this proprietary in vitro model looking at intestinal models. We call it the IM here at Diamond V. It's an intestinal activity modifier model used to uh, look at our product and see how, how it performs in an in vitro setting. We've had numerous certifications within our company for our producing our product, GMP plus, the HACCP certification, uh, certified safe feed facility, and, and, and several others. So as we think about what is our product, and we, when we talk about, talk about this word postbiotics, now obviously everybody has probably heard of probiotics and prebiotics. These buzzwords have been going on for at least a decade now. And so if everybody's kind of familiar with what those are, but you know, a prebiotic is a non-digestible food ingredient that beneficially affects the host by selectively stimulating the growth and activity of microbial populations in the gut. So these prebiotics help these pro probiotics work. And so you think about what a probiotic is, it's a good or friendly bacteria. Um, it's a live microbial that we wanna supplement or ingest into the body for it to interact in the gut. Um, and so when we feed this, the intended outcome is that these microorganisms will survive the digestive process, colonize in the gut, and then utilize the prebiotic materials to create what we would call like a goodie or a beneficial outcome that, the, that this fermentation creates to create uh, good gut health and structure, structural integrity. And so we think about what those outcomes are and from, from utilizing probiotics and prebiotics, what we're really talking about then is postbiotic metabolites or these functional metabolites that, that interact in the gut. And these do include nutrients uh, like um, short chain fatty acids and other things of, of that nature. They have, and many of them have different bioactive components within there from this interaction. And so therefore these beneficial effects of feeding this ex 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 exogenous probiotic may be enhanced and extended by simultane simultaneously administering of a prebiotic and a probiotic. And so when we start thinking about further into postbiotics, so postbiotics can be created in two different ways, internally in the body, which is when an animal has both pre and postbiotics or exogenously where it's created like in our meal and then fed to an animal. And that's exactly what Diamond V does with our products. So why do we think it's, this is a better approach versus feeding them separately as a prebiotic and a probiotic? Well, that comes into the next scenario here, which is the beneficial compounds are already there. They don't have to go through the gut. They don't have to um, survive the, the, the stomach acids. They don't have to deal with those kind of stresses that occur in the body, uh, antibiotic use, stresses, combination of ingredients can cause variation in postbiotics. So if you already have this compound made, then you don't have to worry about that as much. 
And so the main reason that we, we, we were interested in this postbiotic field is things don't always go as what's, what's planned. When you feed these components, the prebiotic, probiotics, you hope they meet up in the gut and they have this beneficial back, uh, outcome. Lots of things get in the way that can be interrupt this process. For example, medications can greatly reduce the potency of probiotics. Some feed processes have difficult or harsh environments that are beneficial for the bugs that we're trying to get into the gut to colonize and create these functional metabolites. So depending on the probiotic and how it's protected, many of the live organi organisms may actually perish there in the stomach acid and never reach the intestine. And that's just the probiotic part. And as I alluded to a moment ago, all the fibers are not created equally and firm fermentability potential can, can vary. So what is the, what are DB aqua uh, postbiotics? So it kind of starts with this, it's a, it's a natural product. Uh, it's obviously a propri proprietary product that we make. It goes through this fermentation process. So we start with like a live yeast and have this fermentation media. We go through a two-step fermentation process. So yes, the live yeast is the starting of the process, but that is not what we're trying to get to at the end. We're trying to get to these functional metabolites. And so it goes through this two-stage fermentation process. In the first stage, it's a liquid phase. And then the second stage, which is a, a drying phase, and then we create our product. And so there are many, many different functional metabolites that are created in this process. And one of the questions I get asked the most is one more important than the other. And the answer is they're all very important because of the interactions all these have. If you think about epistasis, how they interact together, what we may see is some that doesn't seem like it has a, a big, um, like if you're looking at an HPLC graph, it may not show like a big blip on that in that HPLC graph, but what it really shows is, is how all those different things interact together to create what we're interested in. And so what we're trying to do when we do this is create that a product that is consistent and has high quality. And we do this through many different ways. Uh, one of the ways we do this is we look at it through an FTIR spectro, spectro, spectrometer to test the product composition and compare product identity against our library of products. So we do this on, on each batch to say, okay, does this fingerprint match the, the past fingerprint that we've done on all the other ones to make sure our product is consistent? We also do uh, active water analysis and electroprotein analysis and a visual consistency. Then on top of that, we also do some performance testing and then IM model that I was talking about a while ago. It's a biological in vitro intestinal model. We test that on production lots periodically to confirm the product performance that we're expecting from our products. And so how does our technology work? Well, it starts with having a strong innate immunity for better protection. So first it acts with the, the innate immune system. It also has an impact on the adaptive immune system for a faster response and recovery, uh, better gut integrity, and optimal microbial diversity. So these are the four pillars, the four attributes that we're trying to accomplish with this, these functional metabolites. And so it maintains the immune strength, promotes digestive health. So it's this dual action method that we're looking for starting with the immune system and promoting digestive health. Start with a strong innate immune system and then a strong adaptive immune system when needed, but also developing this gut integrity and having the optimal microbial diversity in the gut. So when you think about the immune system and how it works and what energy requirements it takes. So when you're sick, you have this maintenance level in the body that's required just to maintain your body as is. And you have this black box that's filled with things that are part of the immune system. And this is the box that we want to try to keep as minimal as we can, because this green box is the part that we're most interested in having impacts on, which is things like cognitive function, physical activity. You can think about that as like fee conversion or survivability or those different types of things. This is really trying to reach that genetic potential of the animal that we're, that we're interested in. So this black box, we want to keep minimalized so that we can focus the energy that we're intaking to the, to the activities that we're most interested in. And so when you're healthy, you still have the same maintenance requirement from energy, but then we can try to minimize this black box of the immune system and really focus on this green box, which is the physical activity, the, the phenotypes that we're most interested in. And so when an animal 
reacts to a stress or a challenge or anything that that would jeopardize that the 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 uh, black box or the green box things like stunted growth reduced feed consumption poor feed efficiency suppressed immunity these are the stresses that an animal goes under whenever these things occur and so how do we have an impact on that so when you think about the immune system and performance what if the immune system was more efficient so one, it activates when there's a threat and responds quickly and at the appropriate level. Because one thing you don't want to have is an overreaction to a stimulus or a health challenge or, or a stress. And so then whenever it deactivates, the second part of this, it deactivates when a threat is eliminated and that black box goes back down to the, to the homeostasis level. So the goal is, is that you have a, re a response to a, a challenge when it occurs but then it quickly goes back down to the homeostasis level of just maintaining and supporting that immune system. And so obviously in all the different species, when we can maintain that green box, it, it, it promotes things like growth and reproduction or activity and vitality. It helps uh, reduce this, uh, the, the threat of, of mortality or improve survivability. Uh, it helps with, um, skin and coat and allergens and things like that, but it really helps the recovery time of the animal. So when we think about DVAqua and, and shrimp, think about, you know, and we're talking about maintaining immune strength and promoting digestive health. So it improves immunity leading to improved survival, both in the rearing and challenging conditions, maintains gut integrity with increased number and size of tissues related to digestion and nutrient absorption, and increases the proportion of favorable bacteria in the intestinal tract. And so this is a graph here looking at all the studies, well, not all the studies, but a lot of the studies we've done over the, like, the last decade. And so as you can see, uh, we've done numerous studies over the last decade. A lot of these have been published. But what we're trying to show here is even during any condition, whether it's challenged or unchallenged, the average survival rate using DV Aqua is almost 12% higher than the control animals. And then when we look at a very specific target, when we're doing challenge studies alone, we see that the, the difference in survivability is almost double. It goes from 39% up to 67%. So a very significant impact on uh, animals whenever they're challenged. Specifically, we're talking about uh, shrimp here. And so the second part of this, the benefits that we see is an over the average of those 18 studies, we see an increase in growth rate of 5.3% and a decrease in feed conversion of 1.6%. And so Regardless of whether or not the animal's challenged or not, we see improvement in livability, we see improvement in growth rate, and we see a reduction in feed conversion. So now when we start looking at an individual study here, so this is a study that was done in Thailand. It was at a, uh, the university there in Thailand. It was a tank study looking at white shrimp. It's a semi-closed system, and it was a challenge with Vibrio parahemolyticus challenge. So think of it as the early mortality syndrome or the acute hepatopancreatic necrosis disease, so MS or AH, AHPND. And so part one of this study was just looking at a normal growth study. So it was just ignoring that we, we had any challenges. It was just normal conditions uh, with, with, within the facility. So shrimp came in weighing at two grams. They were stocked at a density of 150 shrimp per cubic meter. The shrimp were then fed either control or DV aqua. There were eight replicates for treatment under these normal conditions. So this is the timeline of, of that eight weeks. And then we measured growth, feed conversion, and survivability. And in that part of the study, we saw an improvement in growth rate and feed conversion. And so you can see at the, the first part of this graph here, um, there's my mouse, there was a 12.8% increase in final weight there was a 13.1% re reduction in fee conversion ratio and a 5.6% improvement in survivability. In general, these shrimp did quite well. They had a 90% survivability even as a control. So that's a pretty good a survivability rate in, for, for shrimp. But then when we start looking and diving into the, the challenge study, we see some, some differences. So overall, when you look at this on the the control part of this where there was no challenge, the combination of greater weight and improved feed conversion and numerical improvements and survival rates led to a greater total production. So an increase of 19.5%. But then part two of this, this is when we administered the challenge. 
So the shrimp can, again came in weighing at two grams, uh, stocked at the density of 150 shrimp per meter cubed. Uh, the shrimp were fed uh, either control or DV aqua. There were three replicates of each were challenged with, with Vibrio. And so, as you can see in this part of it, we first had a low, we had, we had a two part to the challenge. We had a low challenge, which think of that as like a chronic challenge, which was from weeks, from four, weeks four to week eight. And then we had what we call like an acute or a high challenge, uh, which is about doubling the, 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 the dose of, of Vibrio that we gave the shrimp. And it was for, we, we measured this for about six days. And again, we looked at survival, immunity, and Vibrio and, and tissues. And so we started breaking these down into what did we see as far as like immune parameters. So under the low challenge, DV aqua shrimp had a significantly higher phenol oxidase activity, but no change in the hemocyte count. So as you can see here, there was a 136% increase in the phenol oxidase activity in the low challenge. And again, remember, this is that chronic challenge that we gave them for that four week period. And even numerically in the high challenge, we saw a difference of an increase in phenol oxidase activity. And the hemocyte count, we didn't see, there was no difference in the low challenge and then numerically higher with the DB aqua. So Vibrio retained in tissue. So these three different tissues that we looked at, the hemolymph, the, the hepto pancreas and the intestine, we saw a reduction in the high challenge, uh, a statistical reduction in the high challenge across all three of these. And numerically, we saw it as well in the low challenge. So in the chronic challenge, um, it wasn't statistically different, but numerically we saw it across all three tissues. But in the high challenge, you see some very significant differences. Um, there was a 17.7% reduction in the hemolymph, 15.3% reduction in the hepatopancreas, and a 21.3% reduction in the intestine. So when we look at survivability under this challenge, so again, under, under normal conditions, we saw a 6% increase. But when we get to this chronic challenge, we saw a 92% increase in survivability. And then this acute um, challenge, we saw 133% increase in survivability. So regardless of what, what area it was in, whether it was in normal or low or high challenge, we always saw an increase in the survivability. But you could really see these, these differences break out whenever we, a challenge was then put on to those animals. So a summary of the, the results that we saw here, under normal conditions, they were heavier shrimp, we improved feed conversion, had better survivability. We had better survivability under challenge conditions. The low challenge had a 92% increase, whereas the high challenge had 133% increase in survivability. And we supported immune parameters, the phenol oxidase activity, and then lower concentrations of Vibrio retained within the tissues. So with that, I'll end there and uh, let the next speaker start. All right, thanks, Derek. Very, very interesting looking product. Um, and uh, there's uh, people lined up there to um, uh, with their questions at uh, the end of this um, uh, end of this event as well. So I will move on now with uh, Stefan uh, Relit. Um, now. Uh, uh, Stefan is the Aquaculture Product Manager of Laumund. He has a solid experience and knowledge of the aquaculture segment in different regions of the globe. He has raised shrimp in Thailand and held several positions within Evialis and Vivo Group in France, playing a role in the setup of its aqua division and Oceanus. After being aquaculture market manager with Diana Group for its Aquative division, he set up his own consulting company, bring his aqua expertise to different organizations. In 2014, he is in charge of the global development of Laomund Animal Nutrition Aquaculture Activity worldwide. Um, and uh, he'll be speaking uh, today about the value of functional yeast and aquaculture feed production. So I will hand over to you, uh, Stefan. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so I will start uh, also by uh, introducing a very quick introduction of the of L'Allemand company. Uh, L'Allemand is an old company because it has been founded more than a centuries ago. Uh, we have uh, over 5,500 employees and we are specialized in yeast and bacteria. We 
produced only yeast and bacteria. Uh, this is uh, our plants, uh, and you see 29 plants which are doing fermentation. We are primary producer, primary fermenter of yeast and bacteria. And we sell the yeast and bacteria in all the market, which are able to uh, interested by life, uh, life yeast and life bacteria, or the its uh, extract. Aquaculture is just uh, one part of the of uh, the company. It's a part of the animal nutrition, but we are also working on the plant care, the human health, human food business, uh, biofuel production, etc. So. Yeast, uh, it's a natural microorganism. Uh, it's actually, uh, it has been part of the human uh, diet for a long time as uh, Egyptian was uh, already uh, fermenting wine and uh, <coughs> doing some uh, leaven bread. Uh, but uh, in the recent years, we have seen increasing awareness uh, about the nutritive value of uh, yeast and uh, it's interested also for, her for health. So the yeast cell wall, uh, the yeast cell, it is a, a karyote cell, uh, which is surrounded by a um, uh, wall, uh, uh, membrane, a uh, thick membrane, uh, which uh, contains some specific uh, compounds like uh, 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 MOS, manan protein, which are on top of the uh, beta-glucan, as you can see here. Uh, the beta glucans itself uh, surrounded uh, the uh, thin chitin layers, which protect the cell membrane, the phospholipidic membrane. Inside the cell, you have a lot of uh, uh, components also, like amino acid, peptides, protein, uh, minerals, uh, and sometimes organic uh, minerals, or uh, enzyme vitamins and some compounds which are known as uh, nucleotides so in in different forms i will not go into details here so these terms like nucleotide manan mos uh, glucans are well known uh, it's uh, it has been uh, uh, demonstrated to be efficient and uh, with proven uh, efficacy uh, for for many years now uh, but in the recent years, we have seen more and more company and more and more product uh, arriving on the market. And uh, it's sometimes difficult to, to compare and, uh, the, the different products. So I wanted to give a simple um, classification and some simple guidelines to help sort the different yeast product that are available for uh, in the animal nutrition market and uh, and uh, yes give some guidelines to help uh, uh, understanding the difference between them and uh, help to choose so as it has been already stated, uh, thank you, Derek. The first difference is, is it live or not? The probiotic, it's a live cell, which is active in the gut of the animal. Uh, and it confers some specificity as it is live, it is integrated as the inside the microbiota. And it has a real metabolic activity and reactive activity, depending on the conditions. If it's not life, then uh, we have a lot of different non-life uh, yeast uh, families. The first one are what I call the yeast culture. So there is a, a different kind of uh, yeast culture. You have the yeast, which is complete, uh, not, uh, not, uh, not uh, processed, and with part of the media the, that serve to ferment the yeast. So inside the media, you can have some metabolites. So depending on the process, depending on the selection and the efficacy of the fermentation, etc., you can have more or less uh, uh, metabolites and uh, more or less variability inside the product. Then a second family of product is the what I call the inactivated yeast. So inactivated yeast is just dead yeast. You, you have the full yeast and uh, with the full membrane, which is which trap, let's say, the components of the of the cell. Then you have some uh, autolyzed yeast. So the autolyzed yeast is a yeast which is dead, and that uh, where the endogenous enzyme from the from the cell start to uh, lyses the cell and especially the cell's membrane. Uh, then you have some more specific 
possible uh, lysis with, uh, with the addition of exogenous enzyme. Uh, this is what I call the hydrolyzed yeast. Uh, and then, of course, it's uh, much more specific because you can choose the enzyme depending on the kind of hydrolysis that you want to do, uh, where you want to cut the molecules, etc., and then to target some specific uh, production of specific molecules, etc. Then you have a big family of product when you uh, inactivate, when you hydrolyze, and you can separate the different components, uh, what I call yeast fraction. So you can separate the yeast cell wall from the cytoplasm. And inside the yeast cell wall, you can also break the yeast cell wall to extract the specific components that you want to get. So this is the yeast fraction family where you can uh, have some MOS, some beta-glucan, some nucleotides, specific and rich uh, uh, product. And you can also formulate the different parts. And then you can enrich the yeast with some specific components like minerals of vitamin, vitamin D, for example, or a very well known also a product on the market, which is organic yeast selenium. So it's the same depending on the uh, process, you can have 100% uh, organic selenium uh, present inside the, the yeast. Another uh, important uh, parameter to consider is the origin of the yeast. Is it a primary fermentation yeast? Primary fermentation, it means that you select the yeast specifically for the final utilization that you are going to do in, uh, in the feed. Uh, so you select the yeast and you select also the process, especially the fermentation process, to maximize the impact uh, that you want to get in terms of immunity, for example, or pathogen binding, etc. The other kind of product is uh, the secondary fermentation. So it is a byproduct. So it means that the yeast is used to, uh, for example, ferment a very uh, a beer or to produce some biofuel. And then uh, you use the yeast uh, afterwards to develop some, uh, some other products. So the function of yeast that are usually uh, used are here, the characteristic are, are here listed in the left of the sheet. So I will not detail everything because I, I will not have time. But yeast are a source of protein, but you have to check the digestibility of this protein. So uh, here, for example, for the inactivated yeast, uh, it contains protein, but the problem that it's trapped inside the, the, the cell uh, wall, uh, so the digestibility is not uh, optimized. On the contrary, if you do some specific hydrolysis, you can increase a lot the digestibility. Same for the functionality, like immune enhancement, uh, pathogen binding, gut health, skin mucus uh, protection. I will give some more example. Uh, depending on the process and the origin of the yeast, you can, for example, once again, in the basic inactivated yeast, uh, the functionality will be very low because uh, the cell wall is just uh, still uh, uh, complete and not, uh, and the molecules like the beta-glucans, for example, are not exposed at all. Uh, on the contrary, once again, if you, you look to the yeast fraction, which are specifically processed and selected for this, you will have much more, of course, efficacy, functionality. So let's take one example, which is yeast cell wall. Uh, what are the possible benefits of yeast cell wall? It is well known for some times already. The mananoligosaccharide, for example, are able to block undesirable uh, bacteria, and then they attach to these bacteria, and the bacteria are not able to attach to the uh, cell host, the fish uh, or the, the shrimp uh, cell. Uh, another very important uh, function is, for example, the immune enhancement uh, 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 response. So with beta-glucan, it is also quite known, you can stimulate the, uh, the immune cells through specific receptors that will in enhance the uh, and increase the immune uh, response. Uh, if you support uh, the immunity, you can also have some impact on the mucosal barrier, for example. So you can increase and play on the mucus uh, 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 quantity and the mucus quality of the fish or inside the uh, mucus uh, also and the immunity inside the gut. So this is 
you have different components uh, from the, in the yeast cell wall, we will see that can influence the immunity. And then you have the prebiotic effect, which is uh, also well known by just uh, uh, favoring uh, some bacteria like the lactic acid bacteria. So are all yeast cell wall alike? No. You understood that, for example, depending on the origin, is it from primary fermentation or is it a byproduct, then the composition and the efficacy will be different. This is one example when you just analyze the basic composition in manan and beta glucan from some byproduct uh, present uh, compared to the primary fermentation group, you see that the composition is different. You can also check some basic uh, particle size. Uh, we checked some uh, different MOS uh, product claiming uh, some MOS activity. Uh, and then you see the particle size uh, in the different product are very different. You can have some big particles and some very small particles, which will, which will influence uh, especially the binding capacity. So this is simple. Uh, analysis that you can do to uh, start sorting the different uh, yeast cell wall uh, uh, yeast products that are present and proposed on the market. But on our side, we wanted to go further and to better understand the efficacy, the function and the ability, for example, to do pathogen binding or immune uh, stimulation. We wanted to better understand the structure of the yeast uh, and the influence of this structure on the functionality. And uh, thanks to new technologies, we were able to go much further and to screen uh, different uh, strains. One of these new technology is uh, IFM, so which is atomic force microscopy, which is which allow to look at the yeast at the cell level. So we are able to analyze the surface of the yeast cell wall and to check for example, here you see the three dimension of the yeast cell wall, uh, which will have an impact on the, the, the function and the efficacy. Or we can select to look at specific molecules, for example, some binding molecules, and to analyze these molecules in terms of uh, three dimension, in terms of structure, in terms of strengths, for example, etc., and uh, to link this uh, structure to the binding property, uh, the pathogen binding or the impact uh, on toxin, mycotoxin, for example, etc. And then this allows us to do much more screening and to use all our strain that we have. Uh, we have some huge bank of strain and to screen all the strains dip and to select the, uh, the strain depending on the function that we want to develop uh, with, the, with the product. And this, uh, this leads to what we call new generation uh, yeast fraction. And here, one of them is uh, the young product, which is a mix a formulation of different part of first of a different yeast strain. So here you see that you have uh, two Saccharomyces uh, 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 strain and one new species, which is uh, Cyberningera. And we select also different part of the yeast to maximize. So to maximize what? To maximize pathogen binding. So here, this is an example of one screening that we do for aquaculture and especially for shrimp. You see that we check the ability to bind, to attach Vibrio, three different strains of Vibrio paramyliticus. And here it's HRHA coli, it's a, a, a positive control that we know well. And we compare the standard yeast to the three different fraction that has been taken for to make young. And you see that minimum we double the uh, binding capacity here we, with this uh, fraction we are even at uh, 100 percent so here and you see some yeast with uh, so here it's a, a picture of HRH coli but which is glued to the to the yeast attached to the yeast another function that we wanted to develop is the immune uh, modulation so uh, we uh, select also the different yeast uh, the objective was to maximize the immune response. What is well known is that beta-glucan, for example, has the capacity to 
induce some immune stimulation and he stimulate the immune cells through one ma major route, which is through uh, a dectin-1 receptor, which is a specific receptor present on the immune cells. So the beta-glucan will attach and stimulate uh, the response. Uh, we know that G cell wall in general can have some influence through other uh, receptors, but our objective was to maximize this response maximize the ability of the yeast cell wall to stimulate the other receptors to have a much broader immune response uh, which we had and uh, here uh, we have a patent pending for this so what we were able to demonstrate that be because of the formulation of the product by formulating these different components we were able to have a synergy in the immune response it means synergy it means that one plus one is not equal to two but equal to three so this is here what you see uh, Another uh, impact also with this much broader uh, stimulation through uh, different uh, receptors allows what we call an immune modulation compared to the immune stimulation. So we can uh, sustain immunity for a longer uh, period without risk of immune fatigue or uh, adverse or uh, adverse uh, performance. So practical uh, uh, results. We have done some trial on uh, shrimp with uh, EHP trials. So EHP, it's an intracellular uh, microsporidy. So the only way to help the shrimp to uh, cope with this, uh, this pathogen is to through immunity. And here you see that we were able with young to reduce a lot the number of pathogen inside the cell of the hepatopancreas, which helps to increase the uh, final weight and to reduce a lot the diversity in terms of size at harvest. Uh, another experiment with the MS, uh, here uh, EHPND, so with uh, Vibrio Parahemolyticus. Here uh, you uh, see that the challenge was very tough. We had only 10% survival in the control, but with the young, we were able to increase a lot the survival, so from 10% to 60%, which is a huge uh, protection. Another example with, I will go quickly with the white faces trial once again in shrimp, where uh, we were able to protect. So here we, uh, white faces is uh, impacting the hepatopancreas. And when we score the hepatopancreas, you see that with young, we had much better hepatopancreas. We were able also to reduce the vibrio content inside the hepatopancreas or to reduce the uh, growth symptom globally of, uh, of white faces. For fish, some other example, if you compare MOS to beta-glucan to young, uh, and we did some experiment to check the capacity to help wound healing, which is very important in, in many uh, applications. And you see that young had a much better capacity to improve the wound healing. Or the last example uh, uh, will be on-farm. It's a trial done, that has been done on-farm in Japan. Uh, the ability to uh, reduce uh, the parasitic uh, load, the skin flux, uh, which is a major problem there on, uh, on the fish called amberjack. And with young, once again, in the farm, we were able also to reduce the uh, skin flux counts on the fish, which help also to uh, improve the growth and the condition factor of the fish. So this is only a few examples. Thank you very much for your, for your time. And uh, if you have some uh, precise question, I will be happy to, to answer. Thank you, uh, Stefan. There's a lot of information on yeast there today. It's a um, certainly um, an amazing organism with uh, there are a lot of beneficial properties uh, to utilization of yeast in various forms. Um, we'll move on now um, and uh, I'll introduce uh, Pierrick Casante. Uh, Pierrick is an R&D aquaculture manager at BCF Life Sciences, where he has been working since 2010. He developed the Kira Aqua range for the aquaculture market, a complete range of natural amino acid mixes extracted from sustainable protein sources, poultry keratin. Prior to joining BCF Life Sciences R&D team, Pierrick worked for 20 years at CAP Diana, company as a project and application manager. 
So uh, he will be speaking today about free amino acid mixes as new functional ingredients for aquaculture. Okay, I will uh, hand over to you now, Birik. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody, and thank you for attending this session. Uh, before starting, I just would like to address my thanks to Aquafeed organization team uh, for this good opportunity to communicate. So thank you, Lucia, Maritza, and uh, Pete for your support. Uh, so my name is Pierrick Kersante. I am R&D uh, manager, uh, aquaculture manager at BCF Life Science. And uh, today, we would like to speak to you to give you uh, a global overview about possibilities offered by free amino acids as functional ingredients for aquaculture feed. Uh, more precisely, I'm going to present your results we obtained during uh, different zootechnical studies, experimentation uh, conducted in universities, uh, research centers, and uh, more recently, directly in a shrimp farm condition. So just to remind, uh, BCF Life Science is an independent and French company. So we are located in Brittany, west part of France. And we are specialized in the extraction of free amino acids. More precisely, we have a unique expertise in the extraction of free amino acids from a sustainable protein source. So we extract amino acids from only one raw material, which is poultry keratin, coming from the poultry feeder. So to quickly illustrate, without going into detail uh, concerning the process, here you have a schematic view of the protein chain, of the keratin protein chain. And our job is to cut the links between uh, each amino acid uh, by extensive acid hydrolysis. And we apply hydrochloric uh, acid uh, on thermic process for complete uh, hydrolyse of the protein chain. And to firstly extract two single amino acids. So we extract tyrosine and cysteine firstly, and we produce a soluble mix uh, of 17 amino acids, mainly on free, on free formed. And we have different uh, form of products. So we have powder form product, uh, liquid product uh, with uh, different concentration in amino acid on uh, specific organoleptic characteristics. So these single uh, mixes of amino acids are distributed uh, worldwide. So we are working with 38 countries on uh, different application fields. So we are present on pharmaceutical application, nutraceutical, but also on biostimulant, baby food, uh, pet food. And of course, uh, on the one which concerns us more today, uh, aquaculture. So before going uh, into detail uh, about trial result, I will just give you a few precision about uh, our positioning uh, in aquaculture regarding the overall context. Uh, because today we are by obligation placed uh, in the context of global evolution towards sustainability, because we have to face to general increase of the raw material costs and the general decrease of the marine resources availability. So for the feed industry, uh, the situation induced a context of marine product substitution. And when we know the efficiency of the marine product uh, regarding attraction, this situation can have a strong impact on the feed intake on the gross performances. And in this context, uh, we know that the mixes of free amino acids are very interesting uh, ingredients uh, positioned as feed intake uh, booster for shrimps. So it's effectively important to keep in mind that free amino acid stimulates uh, feed intake for aqua species. Here, I have highlighted a few examples found in the bibliography, so I won't go into detail. But just to summarize, uh, we can say that for the aqua species, uh, attraction is managed by uh, the perception by the detection of small and soluble uh, molecules on low molecular weight compounds, which uh, stimulates uh, feed intake. Uh, for example, free amino acids, but also nucleotides, small peptides are very efficient uh, attractants on the, when they are on the soluble form. And concerning the shrimp, this perception is managed by what we call the antennular chemoreception. So uh, this processus is uh, well explained uh, by Leon Meyer's feeding model, describing the different steps of shrimp's feeding. Uh, firstly, you have the detection by antennular chemoreception, uh, which generates an orientation on movement toward feed. And then a positive in effect on the taste, which enhance the feed intake and promote uh, the ingestion of the feed. 
So uh, it's very important to consider that uh, the feed attractability, the feed intake, uh, have a very strong impact because, firstly, the feed cost represents the main part of cost is for the farmer. Uh, Plant-based formulation uh, with reduced fish meal inclusion induce a drop of palatability and contribute to increase the detection time. And this increased detection time generates uh, some feed losses on nutrients uh, leaching. And this nutrients leaching uh, generates increased uh, FCR on economical losses. And of course, uh, degradation also of the water quality, uh, inducing some sanitary problems. So uh, regarding our positioning uh, in aquaculture, we have a dedicated range uh, named Caracua. And uh, today uh, we don't have so many time, so I will uh, focus only on one product of this range. So I will focus on Kerastim 50. So uh, Kerastim 50 is a unique uh, product, a specific product with a unique amino acid profile. Uh, this product is generated by the combination of the raw material we use and the specific process uh, of extraction of hydrolysis. And the mix includes uh, 17 uh, amino acids, uh, mainly on free form. So we have uh, high percentages of proline, uh, glutamic acid, serine, glycine, on the branched chain amino acids. Uh, and regarding the relative composition, 92% of these amino acids are on free form. On the other 8%, you can see uh, in, uh, in blue dark on the screen, uh, the other 8% are D or tripeptides, very small molecules. That is very important regarding attraction. On one of the other particularities of the free amino acid mixes is the very high level of individual digestibility. So it's in relation uh, with the extensive level of hydrolysis, ensuring a very low molecular weight. Uh, so we have a product with 100% less than uh, 800 Dalton, and the 92% less than 250 Dalton. So very low molecular weight. And this level of digestibility uh, measured in vivo is close to 100%, so like uh, 97%, which ensure a fast and high level of assimilation by the animal. So now I'm going to show you some uh, evaluation results from studies we conducted in different conditions. Regarding these results, uh, you will show some graphs during the presentation. So I uh, organized the graphs only base uh, 100, so base 100. To, then you will show, you will see the relative gain uh, in comparison with the negative control. And in case you would like to receive a more complete result, uh, I can send you uh, the full presentation of these studies. So on request, of course, don't hesitate to contact me by email, and I will revert to you to send you this uh, full data. So on this figure, you can see the main trends, uh, the average level of performance be rich uh, with Kerastim 50 during recent zootechnical studies. In most of cases, uh, we underline a positive effect on, uh, on feed intake and uh, with improved growth performances and the positive impact too on survival. On the combination of these parameters uh, generates a strong improvement uh, of the final biomass with reduced uh, FCR. So this is the first study uh, was conducted uh, in Yabi Research Center in Vietnam, so on white trim. In the, this study, we evaluated kerosene 50 applied at one dosage. So we work at 0.5%, so five kilotons. So we applied the product in general at this percentage, so at very low percentages on the feed. And we compare it in comparison with the negative control feeds and the product was uh, included into the pellet mass directly. And the experimentation was conducted in cages uh, in pond uh, with shrimp at uh, 5.8 grams of initial body weight, uh, eight repetition per treatment and during 38 days. On, on this evaluation, uh, we noted positive and significant improvement of the growth parameter. So more precisely with more 5.6% of the specific growth rate, uh, more 9.7% of, of weight gain, and a reduction of 12.9% uh, of the FCR. This is our second study, uh, was conducted uh, in partnership with Kazetsard University in Thailand on white shrimp too. And uh, this time we evaluated kerosene 50 applied 
at one dosage, uh, 0.5%, again, 5 kiloton, but with two different way of application. So we apply the product uh, into the pellet mass and by coating around the pellets. And the experimentation was conducted in aquarium. So uh, we swim at 2.5 gram of initial body weight and uh, for repetition per treatment on during uh, 56 days. And uh, we also evaluated three different levels of, of fish meal uh, in formulation, but uh, without underlying uh, any uh, significant effect on this parameter regarding growth. Uh, we saw uh, influence of this parameter on uh, attraction. We will see uh, this point later, but uh, not on growth in that case. So uh, firstly, we saw positive impact on survival. So in that case, it was not significant difference, but uh, interesting tendency. And uh, it's uh, interesting to underline that uh, we always uh, have an improvement of the survival in our studies. So we are more and more investigating uh, this field uh, to better understand uh, uh, the mechanism uh, of action of this amino acid to improve survival. But uh, it's always the case uh, in the, during our, st our study, but today we will more focus on attraction. And we underline strong and positive effect on growth parameters on the final biomass, inducing a reduction of the FCR. And the tendency was uh, slightly better with the application uh, by coating. You, you can see uh, it's, it's more a tendency in that case, but uh, uh, the coating seems to give better effect uh, uh, for the product because I think it's uh, detected easier by this way uh, by the chemo receptors of, of the shrimp. Always with uh, Kazitsad University, this is another study. Uh, and during uh, this study, we have evaluated the shrimp behavior uh, toward the feet depending on treatment. And uh, here you have a view of the, the protocol, uh, schematic view of the protocol with the aquariums. And, uh, we push the shrimps on one side of the aquarium and uh, with a net uh, separating them from the feed. And we introduce the feed at the opposite side with a small feeding tray. And once net removed, allowing shrimp moving toward feed, we measure the time for the first shrimps to reach the feed. And during 15 minutes, the number of shrimps to reach uh, the feed uh, in these de defined periods. And also we measure the feed intake during this period. And what we saw during this evaluation, uh, the feed intake was significantly better, uh, was uh, the treatment uh, supplemented with amino acids. On the defined period of 15 minutes, uh, more shrimps were attracted to the feed, and more 23% of shrimps attracted to the feed. But the most interesting, uh, maybe, uh, result was concerning the time approach. Uh, so we can see that we have reduced the time approach uh, by 29%. Uh, and uh, we can also see that uh, this approach time was influenced by the fish meal level. You can see you have 15% of fish meal, 7.5 on zero for the negative control. And when you decrease the fish meal uh, uh, in the formulation, you increase the detection time. But each time uh, we can uh, improve this parameter uh, with amino acid addition in comparison with the uh, respective uh, uh, negative control. Now I'm going to show you some results uh, we obtained uh, this time in farm conditions. Uh, it's not always easy to organize uh, this kind of trial, but very interesting to have this, this data uh, complementary to the evaluation conducted in uh, research centers and uh, universities. So this first one is just a short evaluation. It's not a scientific uh, evaluation, of course, uh, just, a, just a short uh, feedback from the field, but very interesting. Uh, one be conducted uh, recently in farm in Colombia to evaluate the attraction of uh, kerastin 50. So we applied the product uh, to the feed by coating after dilution into water. And the feed was placed in net during two hours in pond. And uh, we repeated uh, this trial in different ponds. And uh, we saw that uh, more shrimps were attracted to, uh, to the feed during these two hours period. Another short evaluation trial be also recently conducted in Equator, nearly the same condition. Uh, this time we had uh, enough data to conduct some uh, st uh, statistical analysis and uh, we measured the attraction time, uh, we measured the speed of feed intake 
on the uh, heat and field during a, a different period, and we uh, underline that uh, the kerosene 50 uh, strongly improve uh, the, the detection of the field. So this one is very interesting uh, in my, uh, my opinion because it was conducted in uh, Thailand last year in the Suratani region. And uh, we uh, had two uh, separate ponds of uh, similar size, comparative size, uh, that were allocated to evaluate uh, feed added with 0.5% of kerosene 50 by coating in comparison with the negative control feed. And uh, the evaluation started at the same time in the same condition with uh, the same density. And the uh, shrimp evolution size and weight were weekly followed until the final harvest. So I will show you, to go uh, quick on result, I will show you the, the result at harvest time. Uh, we reached higher performances with uh, the pond fed with kerosene 50. We also underline uh, uh, an improvement of the survival on the faster growth of the shrimps at the beginning. And the uh, FCR was strongly reduced uh, on the pond production increased inducing uh, an interesting return on investment uh, for the farmer. This, uh, this is another trial that was conducted uh, in Thailand too, in the same region, Suratani region last year. It's very interesting because uh, during the, the growth phase, we face it to heavy rain, uh, generating a white feces syndrome in the farm. And we saw that the pond fed with kerosene 50 better resisted uh, against the degradation of the sanitary condition. And as previous trial, uh, two separate ponds uh, of comparative size were located for, for, for this evaluation. And uh, this time we applied the product at 0.75%, so a little bit more by coating on the feed. So due to the uh, improvement of the survival and the better uh, comportment of the shrimps uh, again uh, during this sanitary condition, degradation of this sanitary condition, um, we saw uh, a later apparition of the white feces syndrome on the, the test pond on better survival rates. And this had a very strong impact on the final pond production, on the return on investment for, for the farmer. So in conclusion, uh, what you can keep in mind is that uh, the BCF Life Science Care Aqua range offer uh, a unique amino acid profile products obtained from a sustainable protein source uh, with a very high level of digestibility. And these amino acid mixes are very attractant and can uh, significantly improve the feed utilization and generate better growth on survival performances in the farm condition. So here you have my email address. So don't hesitate to contact me on the, uh, in case you would like to receive full presentation of this story results. So, so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Um, the, um, uh, I, I would like to uh, now uh, open up for questions. Now I'm, I'm new to this role uh, myself, I'm uh, standing in for Albert Peck on who's un unfortunately unwell. So um, I learned my lesson yesterday, hopefully, and that there were so many questions coming as there have been today that we couldn't possibly get through them all and, and answering them on order doesn't work. So I'm going to jump around a bit today, and um, let's uh, we'll start at the end first. Um, so. Um, uh, uh, we'll start with you then, Greg. Uh, what um, uh, for attraction, uh, the attraction of the um, uh, free, free amino acids, do you think uh, the specific composition of kerastim uh, can explain these positive results? So, um, I guess, uh, you know, how are these? Uh, how is the uh, composition of the free amino acids of impacting the results? Uh, yes, you're right, because um, some of amino acids uh, are well identified to promote attraction. For example, the small, uh, small size one, for example, the glycine, but also glutamic acid is very interesting regarding attraction. 
and it represents uh, 11 percent of uh, the total of this amino acid mix. Uh, however, there are probably some synergetic effects uh, between some of these uh, 17 amino acids regarding attractions. But uh, maybe the most important point, in my opinion, uh, is maybe the the solubility level uh, regarding uh, attraction because it's improved the detection by the chemo reception. And in our case, uh, these amino acids are of very, uh, very soluble form. And I think it's an essential characteristic improving their detection uh, by the aqua spaces. Okay, uh, well, one more uh, question for you. Uh, this is directed to you again then uh, is, uh, you know, there obviously a, a lot of uh, a lot of results there are directly relating to shrimp. So, um, well, there are multiple questions in this one. Is it uh, better coated or extruded in the pellet? Um, if it's in the pellet, um, obviously extrusion is more extreme in terms of temperature and process. Are there um, temperature stability issues at all with the product? Um, and uh, yeah, if coated, are there uh, issues with um, activity remaining in the water? Yes. Um, first thing, um, maybe to keep in mind is that the, the product is very stable regarding uh, eating treatment. So regarding the process, uh, regarding the, the extrusion process and pelletizing process. So it's not a problem in that case. And uh, it's true that the, the Kerastin 50 is a port of form product. So and we apply this product at very low dosages to reach a good performance. But in most of cases, we apply it at 0 0.5%, so 5 kiloton, 0 0.75 sometimes. Um, um, sorry, I can uh, can start my uh, my video. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And um, the, the the product is 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 very stable regarding uh, the the treatments. And depending on application uh, of user, we have different way of application. In general, in film mills, the product uh, is uh, included directly into the pellet mass. And uh, we have more application by coating uh, directly in farm because at the farm stage, it's easier for the farmer to apply uh, additional products by coating. But there are also some film mills, more and more film mills uh, studying uh, the coating application. Uh, and in that case, uh, in general, the product is dissolved uh, into oil and spray on, on the pellets. It can also be uh, dissolved, and it's most of the case at the farm stage, uh, dissolve it uh, into water uh, on high, high concentration because we can climb to three parts of powder for two parts of water for the spraying uh, onto, the, onto the pellets. So it's uh, easy to to have this two way of application, but we think that regarding attraction, uh, coating, as uh, uh, more efficient because we have a, a, a faster, small release around the pellet of these uh, few, uh, few amino acids that attract the shrimps by the chemo reception. So uh, it's a positive leaching in that case uh, that we have around the pellet to, to generate uh, the, the attraction effect. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, I think, um, uh, directed to uh, both uh, Derek and, and Stefan. Um, and there, there have been several questions, uh, I guess, raised in this uh, a similar um, similar vein. So this, this question, uh, to avoid pathology, um, you have to adopt preventative measures. You explained that supporting immunity is important to help the shrimp against HP infections. But can you support immunity on a for a long period, uh, we know that you can have some overstimulation or so-called immune fa fatigue. So, how is that? Yes, yeah, so I guess how do we handle it? Is it pulse feeding? Can you continuously feed? What is the uh, what's the answer there? Uh, Stefan, if I could, uh, Stefan, you're muted, by the way. It will help like this. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yes, it's a it's a very good question because in, immunity response is quite uh, quite uh, complex, 
And uh, as explained by Derek, it uh, it can uh, requires also some energy, uh, and uh, and it's uh, known that you can have some overstimulation uh, if you don't pay attention. For example, with beta glucans, they are very good uh, support of immune uh, immune. Uh, uh, immune support but if you have a uh, high concentration beta glucan high dose for too long time then you can have uh, uh, overstimulation or uh, or well, what some people if we simplify uh, call the uh, immune fatigue so uh, it's important to adapt uh, the your uh, your uh, utilization of the depending on the product and the target uh, for EHP, for example, yeah, I spoke about EHP because, uh, well, if you, of course, uh, dealing with EHP is very complex. Uh, the only way you can help the shrimp itself is through immunity. You have to do, a, uh, but the major part has to be through the management. But when the, you have EHP in the system, it's very difficult to get rid of it. So you have to also help your shrimp. Uh, but it's on the long uh, on the long run. So uh, to support immunity, uh, to help your shrimp better response when it will need uh, a good immune response, uh, this is uh, this is uh, not so simple. And this is what we wanted to develop, and we managed to develop with this new generation uh, uh, yeast, uh, with what I explained very quickly, stimulating different uh, stimulating the supporting the immunity through different uh, through different uh, uh, receptors so uh, instead of uh, sh uh, should i go into details well the, the, with the immune reaction you have some aggressive reaction of uh, the immune cells that will try to kill or get rid of the pathogen the problem is that it can also uh, affect the uh, the shrimp itself uh, so uh, a natural in the good natural immune reaction if i simplify you have also to balance this uh, aggressive reaction which is which can be part uh, similar to an inflammatory reaction with anti-inflammatory antioxidant uh, 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 improving the anti-inflammatory antioxidant status so uh, this is what we we try to do also with uh, our new generation, and we demonstrate some positive impact on this. I think to add there, just a comment, uh, I think that was very, very well said. I think the goal of what we're trying to do is not to overstimulate the immune system, but to have a balance of the immune system that it's prepared for whenever a challenge or threat occurs. So that it's it's geared to handle that challenge or threat when it when it does happen, and so that's why we we spend a lot of time on doing trials on what is the optimal dose, and obviously the optimal dose is not just on one particular phenotype; it's on multiple phenotypes. But the goal of that is is to have, if you think about even things in the innate immune system, you know, you know, with our product we've shown improvements in things like complement C3. Well, that's the circulating molecule of complement. It's not activated yet trying to kill off something yet, it, but it's more prepared because there's more of it circulating throughout the, the body to be ready for when something happens. So I think the, 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 the great word you say there is balance. It's balance of the immune system and being more prepared. So I do agree with you. You don't, the goal is not to overstimulate the immune system. And the goal is for sure not to overreact to a stimulus that happens, no matter what that threat is. The goal is to be prepared for when something does occur. So, and just in order to um, perhaps clarify for another question here in terms of pulse feeding, the idea is to find a suitable, uh, you know, product and and balance of uh, percentage inclusion in the feed where you can uh, feed continuously rather than having to pulse. Yep. yep. And so our, our recommendation has always been to do continuous feeding because what you don't want to do is this is not, a, for instance, with our product, it's not reactive. If you already have the challenge, can it help with the challenge that's already there? Sure, probably. But you're better off have having it in the body already doing things, interacting with the gut, preparing that immune system for when a challenge occurs. So continuous feeding is always our recommendation. Yeah, it's okay. always the uh, prevention is always uh, always better, of, of course. 
Right, because if you're reacting right, that means you already missed the most important part, which is the innate mm-hmm. immune system to fight off something. So you may you may be technically, you know, have the virus or have the bacteria in the body, but you may never show symptoms of it. And that's really what we're talking about, that green and black box. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You, want to, you want to be prepared for it so you don't, even though you're sick, yeah. you just don't yeah. show symptoms. Mm-hmm. And this, uh, an, a good example is, for example, with white, vi- white spot virus. The, the farmer knows about this. They could have virus in the, in the farm, but without any symptoms, uh, because the, the health of the shrimp uh, allows uh, the, the shrimp to, to maintain the, the virus at a low, low level. But then when you have, for example, a drop in, ter- in terms of temperature, when you have a, a stressing uh, mm-hmm. events, then you will have the, the, the pathology sure. starting. Good question. Thank, thank you. Um, I'll move on to the, this one. Next one will be directed towards Pablo. Uh, we have a, a couple here. Um, I guess the, the first one um, cuts to the chase just to define this um, specifically, Pablo. But uh, people asking the question is this product uh, GM or genetically modified? The, the product was developed through bioengineer, uh, but the product itself do not have any kind of plant DNA at all. It's a safe oil completely tested by Nofema, test, tested by the feed facilities. But the product is a bioengineer product, which okay. is in a way, yes, but totally so, reliable. So to, uh, uh, and. Uh, another a question there that's been raised several times. Um, the a lot of the trials there indicated partial replacement. So it can um, this product fully replace fish oil? And if not, what are the limitations that you see? What you know? What are the particular compounds in fish oil that are limiting full replacement? It's a it's a good question. Uh, the, the product was developed in order to be a complement of fish oil. But we had been running tests as a free fish uh, feed with consistent positive results. Uh, I think it's possible. You can use Aquaterra for a full replacement um, because of high content of ELA, because of very high content of DHA. So the, the fish can grow and perform in a, in a fish farm without problem. But I don't think the industry is really today uh, um, really in, in looking forward a fit like this. I think replacement today is the reality and our product is the best option they can get. Okay. So uh, just to start clarifying there, in trials underway at the moment, it, it appears there may be potential for full replacement, but um, nothing definitive there as yet. Exactly. There are trials going on, but it's not definitive. Are, are you able to clarify on what, what uh, particular fatty acids or, or other compounds are the limitation with replacing fully? I think that the replacement is uh, being in analysis, um, but but Today, my opinion is, is, is not because of the lack of options. It's because the industry still believes on wild fisheries. It's sure. still competitive, it's enough biomass. It's well, there is a lot of a study about f- wild fish biomass available. Sure. So I, but I, I don't think there is a technical limitation to produce fish free feed, at least okay. in the salmon sector. Okay. Um, I guess uh, coming back on, you know, this perhaps might relate uh, more to the, um, the first question then, have there been um, any um, limitations or restrictions, uh, legislative restrictions in terms of trials and, and then going to market in various areas around the world? We are today approved in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and we are in, in, a, in, a, in a progress of application in, in the US with the FDA. And we have a team, regulatory team working around the world, taking all the options and, and also in Europe. 
And um, uh, this one's a question from me, a uh, uh, personal interest. Um, uh, pet food industry, have there been, uh, are there any restrictions on, on approvals for pet food or even human consumption? We have a product which is in, in progress, uh, which is called NutriTerra. And this is a nutraceutical for human uh, consumption. And for pigs, uh, we have not done anything. Um, but I, if they need omega-3, we are positive to, to fulfill those needs. Uh, um, but I think uh, for pigs, I have been reading about. And I think uh, is a, the, it has a kind of an issue uh, for the long chain fatty acids. Not, not, not for us, but the, the concept itself about long chain fatty acid on pig, pig uh, feed. Sure. And for NutriTerra, which is our product uh, designed by um, nutraceutical, this also could be used for pets. Um, and uh, one more question before we leap into a, uh, another topic then. Uh, uh, at this stage, how is the cost comparing to um, wild fish oil? It's a good question. I, I, I read a lot of questions about pricing. <laughs> yes, well, I, I, very, I guess very hard to define at the moment. Because yeah, yeah, everyone price, is asking price is about pricing, good. not only for us, but also for yeah. the other uh, yeah. uh, colleagues here. It's always depending on volumes, always depending on, on the clients and the customers. Of course, it's a difficult question, but uh, today we could say that we are something on between fish oil and a standard commodity canola. Okay, um, so, so, so competitive. You, you, you absolutely can competitive. Be, competitive. It's, it's, depending, uh, it's, it's, it's depending always on, on the feed for, on the oil mix formula. It's depending on what the, the designer of the feed is looking regarding total omega-3, EPA, DHA. I, I think this is the, it's a complex scenario for, for the oil mix, but we are competitive. Okay. Uh, very competitive. And the, well, that, that's always the, the, incru, the crucial part, the most important part with any new feed ingredient. Um, I find there's, there's a lot of feed ingredients that develop that then struggle to get to market because of costs. So. Um, and I guess that, that, that perhaps comes back to, uh, in your presentation, you had uh, information on uh, obviously the algal oils that are coming through. And, and uh, again, is, uh, uh, can they uh, obtain market penetration due to the cost of manufacture? Yeah, always to penetrate the market is difficult with, with an innovative product needs to be tested, needs to be safe, needs to be, the fit needs to perform. And this is why we have been done a long period of introduction with, with commercial scale trials. We feed more than 3 million fish with Alpaterra. Uh, so I think always penetration the market is difficult but the market is also learning about the product and, and the commercial feed plants are always testing and checking quality and com competitiveness at the end. So this is something we can confirm. I mean, our product is competitive, absolutely. Good, no, thanks. Um, okay, so um, other questions here. Um, This this one here, um, I guess it could be um, uh, sorry, I'm just um, reading through some of these questions here. Uh, when okay, so this particular one is on on shrimp, and I guess it's it's pertinent to the life cycle because you know, I guess the shrimp in particular um, it can you know uh, be sensitive mm -hmm. on particular stages of the life cycle. Um, if um, when when should uh, when should they start using the additives in the in the feed cycle? So this I guess could relate to um, your um, uh, your free amino acids or to the yeast additives. Perica, uh, I think you're wrong. Um, okay, yeah. yeah. Sorry, could you repeat? Uh, sorry, I've not heard. 
Um, the, the question was uh, particularly in relation to shrimp, but um, in what stages should of the life cycle should um, these various additives be included? Are they um, from the very beginning or, or at a particular stage of life cycle? And this, I uh, guess this, yes. this is for, for both your product for the uh, Frito amino acids and yeast products as well. Yes, uh, it's true because uh, in the universities, research center studies, we started uh, around 2.5 gram or five gram of initial body weight. Uh, but in the, at the farm stage uh, trial, we started uh, directly at PL14. So just at the beginning, uh, 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 of the growing, uh, growing phase, so ju just at the beginning of the cycle. And uh, I, in my opinion, I think it's very interesting to start early uh, to really boost uh, all the parameters, the growth parameters and the health parameters from the beginning. And uh, we saw on the farm trial result that uh, uh, we better face uh, uh, by starting from the beginning in the, in the farm condition. So I think it's interesting to start early. Are you okay if I add to that as well? Yeah, far away. Um, I think from our perspective is, is, you know, we always recommend as soon as you, the animal can start eating, we recommend uh, putting it in the diet immediately. So the thing about like what we're talking about postbiotics here, um, the, all the metabolites that are produced, uh, they don't happen overnight. They take time to produce, and then they take time to interact with the gut. They take time to interact with the immune system. So as fast as you can get it in there is the most, is, is our answer is the most appropriate time to, to start the, the feeding of it. And again, you know, we don't look at pulse feeding. We look at continuous feeding for that reason, because you want to keep that that primed immune system and that gut integrity the best you can. You know, we sure don't want to see a leaky gut syndrome happen because we, we when they didn't feed it soon enough or not feeding it continuous. So you know, our recommendation is always to, to feed it as quick as possible and, as, and throughout the life cycle. Yeah, sure. I, I would bring the, the same answer because uh, the, the problem, you know, if, if you speak about feed uh, additive uh, that you bring through the feed, uh, you can not, especially on the shrimp business, uh, so it depends on the market, but the problem is uh, uh, it's going through, the feed is usually going through distributors, for example, if we speak in uh, in uh, in Asia, uh, and it's quite, uh, quite difficult, uh, of course, for them to handle several feed. So uh, the objective is to be able to, to develop and provide some uh, some components that could be used in prevention. Once again, the, the term is, uh, is crucial to uh, help uh, to help the shrimp in uh, in, the, in these difficult conditions. So of course it depends on what we are speaking about uh, and what difficult condition you can have because uh, depending on the, the season for example de depending on the water quality etc the challenge might be different of course and then the response also that you you could uh, provide uh, might be also different. So uh, depending on the stage of the shrimp uh, you might uh, want sometimes to to put uh, more pressure on the on the immune, for example, support. Some other time, uh, you the major problem could be some bacterial development in the water or in the gut, etc. So you would like maybe to uh, to put more pressure on the control of this bacterial development, which could be through uh, different solutions. So. Uh, more than uh, saying, okay, should we use it from all, all along the cycle? It, uh, I would say it, it depends also on, on the each, uh, each uh, condition uh, and, uh, and uh, the problematic that you can have depending on the country or the region. Uh, it's not always the same problem that you have. But for sure, once again, I agree with the, uh, with the, with the direct, uh, the prevention is key. And of course, for the amino acid attractability and, uh, and, uh, and feeding, this is a key point at all stage. Okay, thanks uh, for that, Stefan. Uh, uh, everyone, unfortunately, I'm actually going to have to uh, run and leave you. Um, uh, had a prior, I'm going to hand over uh, to Lucia. Uh, and uh, Susie. Um, and um, look, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone for joining. Uh, 
obviously thank all our speakers for interesting uh, topics there. And, um, and thank uh, Susie and Lucia for inviting me on as well. Um, and uh, yeah, look, uh, there, there are other questions there. So I'll leave, leave that with you. And um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kit. Bye. Thank you. You've done a great job. Um, I think we're actually out of time. So you've timed it perfectly. So <laughs> I'm going to just... I'm not going to have to uh, take over after all. So I'll hand it back to this year. And thank you very much, Pete. We really appreciated it. Thank and you. I'm going to disappear. Oh, thank you, Pete. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to all the panel for sharing your time today and your expertise. They were really interesting presentations. And we will send a link to the recorded webinar in the coming days. And if you want to stay up to date on the latest news on the aquafit industry, I encourage you to subscribe to our publications on aquafit.com. And on behalf of the aquafit team, thank all the people for joining in during these two days and see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.